Shana Tova Tikatevu. May we all be inscribed in the book of life for a good and sweet year. I want to begin by thanking all of you for welcoming me and my family into your Kehila Kadosha, your holy community, and for inviting us to become part of your story. Should I come down, or is this good? Okay, all right. My wife, Valerie, and I have three children. Are they here? Wave, okay. <laughs> so Sophie is 16, Aiden is almost 14, and little May, or as the bubbies call her, the bonus baby, is four. So exciting to enter this new year with all of you at a time in the shul's history when it really feels like something big and important is being born. And Rosh Hashanah is all about birthing. It's the only major festival that occurs at the waxing of the sliver of the new moon and not the full moon. Rosh Hashanah is called Yom Harat Olam, often translated as birthday of the world. But if we look closer at the Hebrew, Harat Olam means the conceiving and the gestation of the new year. What happens before birth? Suggesting that on this day, we're like a fetus floating in the womb of the year about to be born. So if Rosh Hashanah celebrates the creating of the world and humanity, then wouldn't it make sense for us to read the first chapter of the Torah today? You know, the very beginning. Why is it that on Rosh Hashanah we're reading instead about the birth of Isaac and the family drama of our patriarchs and matriarchs? Perhaps the rabbis are reminding us that if we humans really want to understand the meaning and purpose of our creation, instead of studying cosmology and the Big Bang, we need to think about the birth of a child, the way that people grow and learn from their mistakes, and the fact that we're all interconnected. Perhaps we're reading about Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, their children and their family drama today, to teach us that in order to repair our relationship with God, we need to work on healing our relationships with God's avatars in the world, people, especially our family, and our extended family, our community. Our sages teach that the world was created because God was lonely and wanted to be known through the eyes of another. So God created the illusion of separation and disconnection so that when we reach out beyond ourselves to connect with another, we'll remember the hidden truth that we are not isolated, but we're part of a greater collective of Imenu Shaba'aretz, this great living Mother Earth, 2,000 years ago, Rabbi Akiva, the most influential figure in the Mishnah, said that the most all-encompassing principle of the Torah is found in Deuteronomy and Devarim, the last book of the Torah, Ve'ahavta l're'echa kamocha, love others as you love yourself. But Ben Azai disagreed and instead quoted the first chapter of the Torah, God made human beings, B'Tselem Elohim, in God's image. This, said Ben Azai, is an even greater principle than love others as you love yourself. Because from love others as you love yourself, one could reason, if I do not feel love for myself, why or how am I supposed to love others? Which is often how it works, right? Yet if I can see every person as a manifestation of God, then each person is a unique outer expression of God's inner self. In our Torah reading today, we read the sad story of how Abraham and Sarah and Hagar forgot this most fundamental principle of the Torah, B'Tselem Elohim, that everyone is created in the image of the divine. When Sarah was unable to bear children, she asked Abraham to have her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, act as a surrogate mother so that Sarah could have a child through her. However, once Hagar conceived with Abraham and became pregnant, she came to despise her boss, Sarah, and stopped following her orders. When Sarah came to Abraham, asking him to step in and help out, he was too afraid to confront Hagar. You go deal with her. She's your maidservant. Do what you will, he said. In deciding not to intervene, Abraham was giving Sarah the green light to unleash her jealousy and rage on Hagar, who was soon to be the mother of Abraham's only child. Sarah put Hagar through the most exhausting and humiliating work possible. And it was so bad that Hagar ran away from home, into the desert. But Hagar had no place to go. And in a vision, God promised her that 
things would be okay. So she returned home and gave birth to Ishmael. Several years later, Avram and Sarah miraculously conceived a child in their old age, and Sarah gave birth to Isaac. As Yitzchak, or Isaac, grew up and began playing with his older stepbrother, Ishmael, Sarah started to worry that Ishmael would be a bad influence on him and jeopardize the great future promise to their offspring. So she told Avraham to kick Hagar and Ishmael out of the house for good. At first, Abraham protested, but God confirmed to him that Sarah was right. In order for Isaac to become the true heir of the nation of Israel, Hagar and Ishmael had to go their own way. And the children of Ishmael would go on to become the nation of Islam. Abraham woke up early in the morning and kicked them out with nothing more than a loaf of bread and a skin of water. Sending them off into the harsh desert with almost no rations was basically a death sentence. And we thought our families were dysfunctional. <laughs> but seriously, it's really disturbing that this is how our foremothers and forefathers behaved. How did they come to be our greatest Jewish role models? Some might say that in their tradition that the foremothers and forefathers are like angels. They're perfect. They cannot make any mistakes. But maybe their struggles are what makes them even more fit to be role models. Though it seems more impressive for them to be like angels, wouldn't you rather have heroes who are more like real people that make mistakes? Doesn't that make them more relatable? Maybe we can actually learn more from people who make mistakes. And perhaps our great ability as Jews to be so self-critical comes from the fact that our role models themselves were so flawed. As we hear such painful family dramas unfold in the Torah reading today, it touches deeply upon our own relationships, how we take care of one another and regrettably, at times, hurt the ones we love. The first thing the rabbis teach about Rosh Hashanah in the Mishnah, the ancient oral traditions, is that on this day, all who have come into the world pass before God. If not on any other day of the year, this is the day that we cultivate a feeling that somehow our personal family stories and dramas are a kind of living Torah that is being written, read, and judged with divine compassion. We're to feel that somehow we are like Abraham and Sarah in that God sees us for who we truly are flaws and all. Rabbi Ibn Pakuda taught, your days are like scrolls. Write on them only what you would like to have remembered. One of the four names of Rosh Hashanah is Yom Hazikaron, the day of remembering, because all of our actions are written and remembered in the book of our lives. All of our actions are recorded in the effects and the impressions they leave on the people and the world around us. Even in our bodies, where we attempt to bury our pain and our fears in ways that wreak havoc on our health. Even those in-between moments when we thought no one was watching. Every once in a while, that motorist who we impatiently cut off, or that beautiful person that we stared at just a little too long, they catch our eye and we freeze. We see ourselves in their gaze our rage, our lust, and we don't like what we see. The former rabbi of a shul I worked at in San Francisco, Rabbi Alan Liu of Blessed Memory said, you know the ones who fully record our lives with an unflinching precision on the mem are the members of our family. This is the tape that never stops rolling. We may look beautiful, positive, and successful in that snapshot that we post to the world out there, but when we come home and take out our frustrations on our parents, our spouses, our children, and our close friends, the tape is still running. And that tape, that's the one that counts the most because our behavior is stored forever in their hearts. Especially children who watch and absorb our actions like permanent ink on the scrolls of their hearts. It's not what we lecture to them about life that gets recorded but it's how we treat others, especially our family. All the good things, all the acts of unconditional love we do for them, 
that build their self-worth and capacity to trust and open up to others, and all of the bad things too, the insensitive and hurtful acts, are passed down from one generation to the next. We can see it in the children and the grandchildren of Abraham and Sarah as well, who managed to carry the family traditions and values forward, for better and for worse. We see that Isaac and Rebecca, Rivka and Yitzchak continue to have the same problems that their parents had. Not a single word is spoken between Isaac and his wife Rebecca about how they want to divide up their inheritance for their children, Jacob and Esau. Instead, Rebecca convinces her son Jacob to lie and trick Isaac into giving the bulk of the inheritance to him, and to him instead of Esau. After that incident, the brothers don't see each other for over 20 years. And Jacob never speaks up to his father-in-law about how angry he is that he tricked him and took advantage of him for 20 years. And of course, we can still see these stories playing themselves out in our lives and the lives of the people that we know today. In order to heal and break the cycle of fear and abuse, we need to look beyond the symptoms and go to the root cause. What is it that feeds the forces of evil and destruction in the world? In our first glance at today's Torah reading, it's really hard to make sense of what happened. Abraham and Sarah, they're legendary for having incredible kindness and hospitality. It said they were so happy to feed and take care of random people that their tent was completely open on all sides. Even if, even if it was time for them to split up, how could they bring themselves to treat Hagar and Ishmael, their own family, like such garbage? Yet, if we dig a little deeper, we can see some very subtle clues of the emotional distance that led to their breakdown in communication and enabled them to hurt each other the way they did. Nowhere in our story do Abraham and Sarah ever speak directly to Hagar and Ishmael about the conflicts that arise. There was no attempt to resolve the situation in a more respectful and a less damaging way. And most tellingly is the fact that every time Abraham and Sarah met to discuss their problems, they never called Hagar and Ishmael by their real names. It was always my maidservant, your maidservant, the maidservant's son, and simply the boy. As we prepare to enter the new year, these stories compel us to look back at our own life story in the past year and consider how often we didn't really see the people in our lives because we were so busy looking at ourselves. How we allowed ourselves to become so distant that at times we saw them as objects to get our frustrations and our anger out on, or obstacles standing in our way. And at that point, we were cut off from God's heartbeat, God's love. Because real love is not about just seeing ourselves. Real love is about seeing each other. But it's so difficult to keep seeing the other person, particularly in marriage. We get distracted, we get lonely, we get self-absorbed. There was this great movie which won all kinds of awards that came out a bunch of years ago called The Kids Are All Right. It's about marriage between two women and two teenage children that they had. And there are many complications and marital problems. And Jules, the woman played by Julianne Moore, says to her children, leaving out the R-rated words. I need to say something. It's no big secret. Your mom and I are in hell right now. And bottom line is, marriage is hard. It's really, really hard. Just two people slogging through the muck, year after year, getting older, changing. It's a marathon, OK? So sometimes you know you're together so long that you just you stop seeing the other person. You just see weird projections of your own junk. Instead of talking to each other, you go off the rails and act grubby and make stupid choices, which is what I did. And I feel sick about it because I love you guys and I love your mom and that's the truth. Sometimes you hurt the ones you love the most and I don't know why. I just wanted to say how sorry I am for what I did and I hope you'll forgive me eventually. So there you have it. Whether it's a gay or a straight marriage or any long-term relationship, after a while, people stop seeing each other. They see themselves, they're looking through distorted lens of their own junk. This problem, of course, also happens between parents and children, siblings and friends. Sometimes we become so blind and so distant that the very existence of the relationship itself is threatened. 
We hope it never comes to this. But these kinds of wake-up calls can trigger what the sages of the Talmud called tshuva miyira, repentance out of fear. Fear of loss can be a powerful motivator. But what if repentance wasn't really all about feeling guilty or terrible or sorry or afraid? What if it's really about coming back to who you really are and who you're supposed to be all along and doing the repair work needed to get there? Our rabbis teach that tshuva me'ahava, repentance stirred by love, has even more power to heal and help us remain healed than repentance out of fear. This is the deeper meaning of why we dip apples in honey. The apple skin is red, tart, and dry. This represents judgment and fear. But we smother it with sweet honey that sticks to the apple, representing chesed, love, and kindness. In eating them together, we pray that the pain, fear, and judgment of the past will be touched and sweetened by the love and compassion we douse it with in the present. When we turn out of love to heal our relationships and not out of fear, we have the power to transform our mistakes into a force for good. In the Talmud, Resh Lakish famously said, great is the power of tshuva, returning to God, for a person's intentional sins become like unintentional sins. But in another place, Resh Lakish says something even more startling, that tshuva can transform a person's intentional sins into merits. The sages explain that there's actually no contradiction here between these two statements, of course. The first case, intentional sins becoming unintentional sins, refers to tshuva miyira, returning out of fear. The second statement, where sins become like merits, that's when we return out of love. Sometimes our relationships become so entangled that we become like a useless rope, all caught up in knots. And when this happens, we have to cut away the mess and repair the cord and retie it, that cord that connects us together. And if we think of ourselves as standing at one end of the rope and our loved ones at the other, then the repaired rope, when we tie it, when we cut out that place and we tie it together again, then we, the repaired rope actually brings us closer than we might have been had we never severed the connection in the first place. Such is the power of tshuva me'ahava, repentance stirred by love. During these 10 days, we're given the time and the extra measure of courage and strength to shine the light of awareness onto our wounds so that we can see them clearly and begin the work of tikkun, of healing and fixing. We may sometimes worry that traumas from our past has, have left us irrevocably damaged and there's no hope for healing. But neurological research proves that our brains are in a constant state of plasticity and change. When we become more aware of our own issues and how we project them onto others, we're less likely to keep unconsciously hurting the ones we love. Life is short and we've only got 10 days until Yom Kippur. Why not take a moment during this service to close our eyes and think about a person in our lives for whom it would be a mitzvah to have a meaningful conversation with? Imagine what their face will look like when they see, when, you, when we see that they too have been hoping for an opportunity to reconnect. You don't have to know how it's all going to work yet. All you need to do is begin the conversation from a place of love and have faith that you'll figure it out together. Dr. Robert Waldinger, co-author of The Good Life, Lessons from the World's Longest Scientific Study of Happiness, reports that the strongest predictors of who stayed not just happy, but who was healthy as they went through life, the strongest predictors of happiness and health were the warmth and quality of their relationships with people. We get little hits of well-being from having positive interactions and bonding with the people in our lives. Good relationships are stress relievers. When something stressful happens during the day, my body gets all revved up. But if I have someone who's a good listener that I can come home to or call on the phone, I can literally feel my body come back down to baseline if I can talk to somebody about it. Perhaps that's why in Mishnah Perkei Avot, Rabbi Yeshua ben Parachia gives his most essential wisdom for a good life. Ase lecha rav, make for yourself a rabbi. That's an important one. And then he says, Ukne lecha chaver, and acquire for yourself a friend. 
perhaps even more important. And judge every person favorably. Maybe the most important. We can start the year off right by prioritizing time with family and friends and community just as we would for exercise or any other thing that help us live longer and healthier lives. We might think that our good friends and families will be with us forever, so no need to help do anything to keep those relationships healthy. But just like our bodies will wither away without exercise, we also need to prioritize our social fitness. What they found in these decades-long studies on happiness was that there are people who never thought they'd have good relationships and then found a whole collection of good friends in their 60s or 70s. There were people who found romance for the first time in their 80s. It's scientifically proven by this study that it's never too late to find friendship, love, intimacy, and community. Husbands and wives, Remember that moment when you realized that you were soulmates and you wanted to spend the rest of your lives together? That feeling in your body of peace when you couldn't stop smiling and every time they walked in, the room lit up? It's finally time to turn our gaze away from the endless distractions and back into the glowing eyes of our beloved to remember that love can continue to blossom and grow new fruits in every stage of life as long as we are both willing to turn from love, to do teshuva me'ahava. Children and teenagers, whoever's still left out there, can you remember how you saw your parents when you were really little and they were your heroes? Remember how awesome you felt riding on their shoulders? Remember how specially loved you felt when you got sick or hurt and they knew just how to take care of you? Remember coming home from a long car trip late at night in your pajamas when the car pulled into the driveway ever so quietly and they opened the door as quiet as they could, you were still asleep or you pretended you were still asleep because you wanted them to pick you up ever so gently and carry you to bed. Old friends, remember when you felt like they get you better than anyone else in the whole world, like you feel seen, like you could just really be yourself with them and laugh at the absurdity of it all? All that love from the beginning it's still here, and it always will be. All we have to do is open our eyes and our hearts to really see the people in our lives. Not who we think they should be. Not the junk that we're projecting onto them. We can break down the barriers of communication today. Start by doing something fun together that you both enjoy. Go to a game, ride bikes, cook together, go apple picking, go for a hike in the woods, light Shabbos candles, have a Shabbat dinner together. In doing this work today, you're not only healing your relationship in the present, but you're also helping the future generations downstream. And you're even redeeming the souls of your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents upstream. Because you're healing the inner wounds and conflicts that were bestowed upon you by them and transforming them into a force for good. This is the power of tshuva me'ahava, repentance stirred by love. My Rosh Hashanah prayer is that over the next 10 days, the Holy One grant all of us the courage, the strength, and the love to really see the people in our lives and love them for who they are. We're taught that no human can look directly into the face of God, not even Moses. But when we see through to the soul of someone that we love, we are seeing the light of the face of God. Shabbat Shalom and Shana Tova Tikatevu Vetechatemu. May we all be signed, sealed, and delivered for a year filled with sweetness, health, and lots of love. Amen ve Amen.